Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, I, I would like to welcome you in, in this uh, session of our postgraduate courses. And today it's a special day because uh, we have the honor to, to have with us uh, Professor David Ippolito, Professor of Radiology at Monza University, uh, which is a, a, a very renowned uh, scientist and a very good speaker as well. So I would like uh, Professor David to thank you for your continued support since you were last year, you are here. And of course, it is so, so important that you, you came here, you are in the room, um, uh, which is uh, nowadays, it's not that usual yes, for speakers. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you, thank you very, very, very much. And you have very, very, two very interesting topics for us to, to present. Uh, I, if you don't mind, we will uh, start with uh, the first one, the challenges and pitfalls of current human clinical practice of artificial intelligence in liver imaging. Any possible added value, which is very, very challenging yeah. because any is, uh, can, can be translated to two ways. Yes, <laughs> I totally agree with you. Okay, sure. thank you very much. So, Okay, I can. How work? Yeah, nice. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Rasopoulos and Professor Atsidakis, to invite me for this postgraduate course. And uh, in the next uh, hour, I'll give you two speech about two of the most important uh, state of the art topic in the radiological world. And uh, let's start with the first one that is dedicated to the artificial intelligence in liver imaging. And uh, I'll try to show you which are the possible application of this new technique and clinical practice, but I would like also to show the main challenges and the limitation of artificial intelligence. And before starting, I would like to show my mood when uh, Professor Atsidakis proposed me to talk about artificial intelligence and the liver imaging. I was really excited and really proud about that. But only a few hours later, I understood which kind of a matter I was, because we have a lot of topics to talk about. We have a lot and uh, high amount of uh, focal liver lesion and several applications on liver imaging. And for this reason, I started to making a research on PubMed. And what I found is a really is that the amount of publication increased dramatically in the last five or ten years, and the most of publication has focused on the application of CT and MAR, and so focused on the radiological world in artificial intelligence. But I uh, pour to myself an important question: How many radiologists routinely use and clinical practice the AI? Because I do not. Uh, so many people that are really used or get used to work with the AI. And obviously, again, I, try, I tried to understand which are the main reason of this difficulty to work with the AI. And I found, from a clinical point of view, three different radiological moods. The first one are those group of radiologists that are really enjoyed to work with artificial intelligence because they, are, they think that the AI is the solution to virtually any problem in imaging. But in the opposite way, a high amount of radiologists are quite sure that we lose the job. And finally, we have a third group, the, those one that are sure that the AI will never substitute their job. But now let's start with the definition of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence uh, is intelligence applied by the machine in contrast to the natural intelligence displayed by humans. And in the radiological world, it is a branch of computer science that deal with the acquisition, with the reconstruction, with the analysis, or with the interpretation of medical images by simulating the intelligent human behavior, obviously by using the computer. And therefore, we can use this technique in several steps of a radiological world or during the workloads of patients, starting from the 
uh, entrance to the hospital or regarding the protocol or the detection of lesion, classifying and writing the record. So we have a lot of possibility in which we could apply the artificial intelligence. But uh, to simplify the description of artificial intelligence, we know that today exist only two main algorithms. The most traditional one that is called the machine learning algorithms and the other one that is called the deep learning algorithm. And now I'll try to describe to you in the most simple way how did they work. The traditional machine learning algorithms rely on the predefined engineered features. And therefore, it means that the software is able only to recognize some specific classification that was uh, decided and predefined before during the development of the software. While the deep learning is based on a neural or network structures that works like the human brain. And it means that the software starting to learn itself by working. So every by, uh, day by day, increasing the number of uh, examination, the software learn which features it can recognize and which can uh, and uh, what kind of answer it can offer us in terms of classification. So they work in a really uh, different way. But why in today's clinical practice uh, there is so an, uh, an important demanding of artificial intelligence? I think that the most important reason is the continue increasing in imaging data and in the increasing of productivity in the radiological uh, center. And at the same time, we assist to a significant reduction of the readers. So we need uh, someone or something that works uh, on behalf of us or that support us in everyday clinical practice. And for this reason, we should define which is the most important aim of artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence should be into integrated into the clinical workflow, having as main aim to assist the physician, but in which way they can assist us. The artificial intelligence should increase the efficiency of the radiological daily workflow by reducing the error and achieving objective response when we look at the imaging. Moreover, the artificial intelligence may provide in the quantitative assessment about the imaging evaluation, so it works in a different way of a human eye that work in qualitative assessment. And finally, the artificial intelligence should help us in saving time during the repetitive task, especially during the follow-up uh, study or in order to avoid the very time consuming procedures. And let me show now which are the most important application of, liver, of artificial intelligence in liver imaging. They are represented by detection, oblivion, characterization, and monitoring. Let's start with the detection. And we know that detection means possibility to detect potential abnormalities within our images uh, on the basis of change of intensities or on the basis of different and altered enhancement if compared to surrounding structure. And so in the most simple uh, definition, the artificial intelligence in the detection can be compared to a CAD system computed either diagnosis. So a system that is able to recognize each different lesion, in this case, inside the liver parenchyma. And only later, the radiologist will be able to decide if a certain annotation needs further investigation and if, not, if the annotation are correct from radiological point of view. And in a recent review, uh, the deep learning approach was used to highlight and study and recognize several uh, liver diseases represented by the liver steatosis, the liver cirrhosis, and focal liver lesion. And the artificial intelligence system offered a very high diagnostic accuracy in the detection of new liver tumors or in detection of liver steatosis and the liver cirrhosis, while the diagnostic accuracy is very low if the software try to understand which is the main cause of the metastasis. And obviously also in the detection that it seems really simple, there exist some challenges for artificial intelligence software. 
because first of all, the software should be able to recognize each different focal liver lesion, avoiding to create a very large area of the disease. And it's important also during the follow-up after the treatment. And again, the, soft, the artificial intelligence software must be able to distinguish the real lesion from those adenomas. Like in this example, a patient that has two very big adenoma lesion in the third segment, in the fifth segment of the liver, but at the same time, during the arterial phase, we can recognize this patchy enhancement due to a venoocclusive disease. And so the software must be able to recognize each different entities. And again, another great challenge for the AI software is represented by the so-called 3D contests, because it is essential. Because if we try to look at single slice, the software must not be able to recognize cyst or biliary three dilation. While if it work in 3D with 3D approach, is more able to distinguish to distinguish each different entities. Let's move now to the characterization. But unfortunately, the characterization is very unspecific term because we define it as an umbrella term because it refers to the segmentation. That is the possibility to delineate the edge of each lesion. It includes also the diagnosis, so make the correct uh, uh, type of lesion that we could found. And finally, it should help us in staging the focal liver lesion. And let's start with segmentation. We know that from clinical point of view, it's important the segmentation of the liver and segmentation of liver vasculature, of liver vasculature as well, both with CT and with the MAR because uh, uh, it helps uh, not only the radiologist, but also the surgeon, the vascular surgeon and the clinician before any possible procedure, because we have to know the liver remnants before any uh, surgical treatment. And today we have several software that are really able to recognize the most important hepatic <laughs> vein, to recognize the portal vein, and so to delineate each different segment and to calculate the volume for each segment. And therefore, it is able also to calculate the remnants before any surgical approach. But the so, and yes, fine, uh, finally, we do not forget the manual segmentation is a really time consuming process and it could be prone also to human error. But there is a lot of paper that describe the possibility of deep learning system to recognize metastatic lesion and automatically segment the lesion and then automatically convert uh, it in a radiotherapeutic planning treatment. So we have a lot of application regarding the segmentation. Another typical application of the segmentation is the possibility to pick up those repetitive routine tasks. Here we have a typical example of a patient with a liver polycystosis, so a really high amount of liver lesion, cystic lesion, and in everyday clinical practice, we have to measure each lesion and we have to follow up along with the time. And we know that is a really time-consuming procedure, especially during the follow-up, because we have to understand if the amount of lesion and the diameter of lesion remain the same along with the time. But what we can do now, in every day, we can also to offer to our patient the overall volume of all of the cysts. And therefore we can understand any possible evolution and the need of a surgical transplantation. Another great field of interest of application of segmentation software is the primary sclerosing cholangitis. We know that it's an autoimmune disease characterized by the development, development of several uh, biliary stenosis associated with biliary 3 dilection. This is an autoimmune disease, and the typical, develop, the typical evolution is the cirrhotic evolution, and usually the patient can die in a really young phase of their life. Therefore, it's important to follow the patient along the time. And what we do now, usually we compare from qualitative point of view, the biliary 3 dilation. And so looking at this set of images, we can think about that the patient is responding to the treatment. But to confirm this diagnosis, in our clinical practice, in every day, we use the software that offer us a quantitative assessment of a biliary three stenosis, of number of uh, the stenosis. You can quantify the amount of biliary dilation and the overall volume, everything in an automated way. And so 
the software are able us to compare the results. If we look at the previous examination, we can see that the number of ducts dilation was doubled from uh, 2016 to 2018. And if we look also at the overall volume of the biliary component, it's doubled again. And so if we try to look from a qualitative point of view, we think that the patient has responded to the treatment, while if we look from a quantitative point of view, we understand that the patient is not responding to treatment. So it's really important in some specific disease to offer quantitative information more than qualitative information. While regarding the diagnosis of hepatic malignant lesion, it remains today a really challenging task. And for this reason, in clinical practice was introduced the, the so-called radiological score. And one of the most famous one is the LIRADS. And this score has as main aim to improve the radiological diagnosis of lesion, reducing the interpretation and the variability in the final diagnosis, and finally improving the communication with the other clinician. However, the increasing complexity of LIRADS has made its implementation less feasible in those centers with a really high volume practice. And again, for this reason, we can take an advantage from application of artificial intelligence software. And one of the most important papers was published in 2019 describing the application of deep learning system in recognizing focal liver lesion and in uh, characterizing the lesion according to LIRAD system. And we can appreciate that the diagnostic performance is of 92% when we try to uh, differentiate each different focal lesion. And the diagnostic performance is of 94% if we try to categorize the sure benign, benign lesion, LIRAD1, compared with hepatocellular carcinoma and with the neoplastic non-HCC lesion. So the diagnostic performance of the software was really high, especially if compared with the human eye. And the time to reach the correct classification for the software is only 5.6 milliseconds per lesion. So it's a really a high diagnostic performance. But again, also in this paper, we have a great challenges, a great limitation, because it was used only lesion with typical imaging features on MRI. So the authors excluded the lesion with more ambiguous features or with poor image quality. But we know that in everyday clinical practice, uh, we have to look and check and write the, rep and write the report for all kinds of images. We, have, we do not have any possibility to choose what we want to look at or what we do not, don't want to look at. But this performance suggests that the deep learning system could serve as a quick and reliable second opinion, if we need, in the diagnosis of hepatic lesion. So helping us to reduce the interpretation difficulty and interreader variability as well. But regarding the interpretation of the disease, don't forget that one of the most important limitations for AI software is the protocol, the acquisition protocol, because we know that in most of center we use different acquisition protocol according to the different focal liver lesion. And this approach is real not only for CT scan, but also for the MRI analysis. And therefore, if we want to obtain the same kind of results, the same high diagnostic accuracy, we need to use the same uh, routinely acquisition protocol to increase the efficiency of software. But we know that it's not reliable from a clinical point of view in most of the cases. Now let's move to the monitoring of the disease. Disease monitoring obviously is essential for the evaluation of treatment response. And in most of cases, the radiologists are really able to recognize some specific characteristics of tumor, like the modification in size, modification of the shape, or development of, capi of cavitation. But we are not so able in uh, recognizing other characteristics like the variation in texture or some other features of each lesion according to the different technique. Moreover, when we work with uh, neoplastic alteration, when we monitor them, usually we use two kinds of uh, response criteria, the RESIST 1.1 and the WHA, WHO criteria. They use the, in this case, you are able to measure the maximum 
axial diameter and the variation along the, of the time. In the other case, we use two uh, perpendicular diameter. And when we work in linear practice, we know that it's the best system. There exists, again, a lot of software that are able to measure recognizing the lesion and offering us also the overall volume. Moreover, the software are really able not to recognize the, or not only to recognize the lesion, but also in follow up the lesion in an automated manner and offering us, relying us uh, several kind of response according for each focal liver lesion or according to the specific criteria that we used. But again, also in the liver imaging, we have another issue because we do not have only metastatic lesion, but we have also the hepatocellular carcinoma lesion that has is pro is a typical response criteria that are called the modified resist criteria or EAS criteria. In this case, we are not able to measure only the maximum diameter, but we have to consider also the enhancement because it expresses the viable tissue against the necrotic component. And again, if you want to work in the liver domain, we should buy different software for different need of our hospital or different need according to the different patient. And so now it's time to decide which could be the prone and the cons of application of artificial intelligence in everyday clinical practice. The most important limitation, both for tomography, uh, both with CT and MRI, is the reconstruction algorithm. Don't forget that they, may, they control the properties of images more than the object does. Another great issue is the importance of protocol. We should work every day with the same acquisition protocol and models of imaging system must do the same. And finally, we have to check the quality because the high amount of noise or the presence of artifacts may reduce the diagnostic performance of our software. And what it means from a clinical point of view, that theoretically, we should work with the state-of-the-art technology. So if we work, if we buy an artificial intelligence system, we should invest more money on our uh, CT or MRI scanner or ultrasound scanner in order to increase the value of our results. So we need more money every day. This is the message. And this is a typical example of artifacts. We know that a patient that undergoes surgical treatment may have metallic artifacts inside the liver parenchyma. In this case, the performance of software is really low. And so what we have to do in this case, we should have another software that is dedicated to the creation of, to the, it's created the, for reduced the metal artifacts, and then the software will be able to recognize any possible lesion. So again, we have to invest money in other things. Or this is another typical example of the limitation of artificial intelligence. We know that reducing the thickness of our images, we are able to recognize and detect small focal liver lesion. But unfortunately, if we reduce too much the thickness, we significantly <coughs> increase the noise. And a high amount of noise, but it's not really useful to be combined with algorithm software uh, and therefore, again, we should find a good compromise between thickness and quality of the images. Or we should have a software that is able to reduce the noise, like the iterative algorithm or the model-based algorithm or the new photon counting system. And the artificial intelligence usually works in a different way if compared with human intelligence. Because usually the artificial intelligence excels just in one task, like in the detection or in the characterization, in staging and monitoring, and so on. And so we have to decide before which software we need according to the hospital need. And another great issue, an open question, includes the ambiguity who is in charge about the response of artificial intelligence. And if you have this software at our institution, we should offer the answer to the question or should we should not? This is the really important question for us in everyday clinical practice. And so before by a system, we need to determine which specific radiologic tasks are important or will benefit in our hospital. And we have to evaluate the strength and the limitation of this algorithm. And do not forget that till to date, the artificial intelligence has 
The main aim, as we said before, to offer a second opinion to everyday uh, life. Because having an algorithm that runs in the ground, it offers an easy way for a second opinion. The algorithm can serve also as a backup system to check the diagnosis of the physician. And finally, it allows the radiologist to gradually get used to work with the AI. And so they are able to change their mind about the performance of the software. Moreover, the main aim of, uh, of this artificial intelligence is to reduce the inter and the intra observer variability. Because we know that also the best radiologists, the best trained radiologists might differ in their diagnosis sometime if compared with other radiologists. And in the morning when we are well rest, we may highlight some specific features that cannot be recognizable at the end of the day when we are really tired. Moreover, different radiologists might emphasize different aspects in their record. So is, uh, the AI software today has the possibility to decrease or even eliminate this variability between the different radiologists record. And now what should expect from the future? We should expect to ask to our support system, which is the diagnosis, and it will offer us back. I don't think so. It's almost impossible for the next decade that AI will replace the radiologist uh, in the everyday uh, clinical life, but the radiologist that is using AI will replace those radiologists who do not. And with the advancement of artificial intelligence, the radiologist will achieve an increase accuracy with very high efficiency level. And now I would like to thank you for the kind attention, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Polito. It was a, a really spectacular talk because you, you managed to, to, give, to give us a good insight mm -hmm. of artificial intelligence in liver imaging in just 30 seconds, <laughs> which is, uh, 30 minutes, yeah, I saw, yeah. uh, sorry, but uh, which is not so easy to do. So thank, thank you very much. A uh, very comprehensive talk and um, a lot of questions may arise because the topic is uh, <clears throat> extremely interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think that nobody uh, has uh, uh, relaxed us to, to, to some aspects of artificial intelligence. For, for example, we do need a uh, quantification of every measurement, yes. which is very important. The eye, yes, the eye cannot, cannot provide such, uh, yes. such an information. Of course, it's, it's true. I think everybody agrees that um, texture analysis gives here, uh, 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 can give us more information than our eyes can, can provide. But this, these are very fundamental things uh, in favor of artificial intelligence, and I think everybody agrees. But um, I would like your opinion. You, in, the, in your first slide, you, you saw three yeah. types of people. The, the one is uh, happy with artificial intelligence. The other one is um, rather um, rather unhappy because they they, sh they think that they probably lose their jobs. And the third one is laughing with artificial intelligence. Which uh, in which uh, category? Are I think that I must be polite. So <laughs> the best category is fusion of all of them because <laughs> I'm really happy to work with artificial intelligence. But I know in which way it can help us. And I think that, as you said, that quantification is one of the most important things because we waste a lot of time in follow-ups of disease. And if we are able to reduce this time and focus only on the diagnosis or in those challenging cases, we can uh, improve our everyday clinical practice. But I think that we could be really enthusiastic about the application of the, of the software, sure. But obviously, don't forget that we need to invest a lot of money because still today, each uh, different vendors offer only a specific software for each specific issue or specific task. And uh, this is not reliable. So we need to wait, I think, five more years when the big uh, vendors will buy all of the possible software and they will offer us at the lowest price. Because even if for, it's not possible to management this high amount of data with a high amount of software, and also the compatibility with the software is not so simple. So there's a lot of issues to think about before moving towards AI. 
uh, I don't consider, I do not consider your answer as a political one. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it reflects the reality. Yeah. Uh, you say fusion of the three uh, major uh, views. That, that's true. Uh, that, that, that says that we'll see, we'll see. It's not, it's not clear yeah. what, what will happen in the future. So that, that's true. That's true. But since you have experience, I'm, I'm doing uh, such a conversation to explore uh, your view uh, due to your experience. Uh, because you know, uh, the, the concepts of artificial intelligence are new, not new. Uh, classifiers, uh, network classifiers, uh, uh, first and second order statistics are old ones. Yeah. 90s, 80s, yeah, the, yes no. the biomedical engineers have a lot of reports, even in the 70s, about... Uh, yes, but about, the, the technology at that time was not... So yes, yes. So it's not a new concept. Yeah, concept. Exactly. I, actually, we do, we do have a lot of uh, computer power. That's why this can become a reality. But since it is an old concept, that, uh, that despite the improvement in computer um, power is not solved and it, uh, it is not visible in the near future to have um, an umbrella artificial intelligence system. Uh, this, it's just the opposite. We are producing more and more different softwares that cannot communicate with them. Even different vendors uh, can not, uh, you, you know better than me, the, the problems that artificial intelligence have. You see, do you see in the in the blessed in, in the in a reasonable period of time, let's say ten years, that we will have a, a solution on this problem, or they will stay forever? And the second question is, if we do have uh, such a a, a, a solution. Uh, the, the artificial intelligence will uh, solve their problems, and finally, we will have, a, a, let's say, a global system that can make makes everything in every city machine in the world, in every pathology. If this happens, is there any need for a biologist anymore? If it happens, yeah. okay. I'd I, I, I like to have your okay. your, 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 your I'll give you a very maybe silly answer because usually I compare the artificial intelligence to everyday everyday life, and maybe you know that all of us in the last three or four years use the GPS when we drive. I start to drive twenty years ago. I know how to drive. I remember the main road of my city, but now the GPS helped me to avoid the traffic or to help me to avoid to waste my time when I drive, but I know how to drive. So again, I think that the artificial intelligence will support us in the future. We will have a uh, high amount of software that will work in the background during our clinical practice, and then we will decide what is correct, what is useful, and sure, we have no choice. We have to work together like with our mobile phone, but I think that we will not lose our, our job. Uh, we will continue to drive and we will uh, take only the advantages of the technology. Yes, I think, but uh, I don't know if you agree, but uh, this is my uh, opinion regarding the recent history of. Uh, Actually, uh, I do agree because you said that we have to work with artificial intelligence because everybody in the planet likes to work with artificial yes. intelligence so who we could, cannot refuse it. Right? Yes, as a cardiologist. Sure. And then you really... told us about the GPS, which is a very good uh, type of uh, um, metaphor. Yeah, yeah, metaphor. <laughs> it's, 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 it's an Italian, but it's a good word. Yeah. Uh, um, but if, if, if I, I use also GPS, everybody uses. But if I have um, uh, a problem to, to obey the GPS on my ability to drive, Usually, I prefer my ability to do that. <laughs> you are able to decide what to do. Yeah, this is yeah, the, yeah, the message. That's the, that's the, you can take on the advantage or decide. But the cars in the future, they, they will decide by themselves, <laughs> not by your friends. So, I am not sorry, sorry. 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 sorry for that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Davide, thank you very much for giving this uh, excellent presentation. and. Uh, uh, 
very interesting also political aspects of the future. And I will uh, continue on this spirit because uh, behind us there are people who will work for the next 30 years. Yeah. We will not, but they will. <laughs> <laughs> we will have to work, perhaps. But uh, for sure, they will work for the next 30 years. And uh, when I started 30 years ago, um, international radiology was uh, just on geography and some drainages. And in the last 30 years, it changed it, everything. So uh, it's all because of industry. It's all because of capacity of uh, computers. And this is uh, the climax on this. And uh, for the future, I think, yes, next 10 years, it will be realistic. Of course, until then, um, the radiologists, which will not adopt, and you said it before, uh, the radiologists will not uh, lose their jobs, but perhaps they will get replaced by others who will work better with AI. And this is uh, something they should keep in mind because uh, the administrations uh, in the private and the public hospitals will want to have people who will, who will uh, uh, use such things, which will be very expensive. And hopefully you, we will have one tool for everything Perhaps not, because now you buy a city of uh, Siemens, you have another workstation. You buy another one of Philips, another workstation. We have to learn all workstations. But there are also common uh, applications using all kinds of different uh, machines. And uh, radiologists who, who works with technologies should be always open for new and novel technologies um, because he will be asked to use them. And if um, the cars get GPS or automatic GPS, and they will guide you better, this is something the driver should adopt, adopt with that. Uh, yeah. That's for sure. So everybody should be uh, willing to learn all this, and especially the youngs who, who play better with from us uh, mobile. with the mobile phone and the technology and computers. But I, I wonder if um, somebody who is selling you a software uh, about lung nodules, for example, and he doesn't have a good program for liver nodules, what is uh, what's the future in this? Because the, the hospital will never invest in something which is partial, only something partial, only for the liver, only for the lungs, or only oncological uh, in total is more interesting yeah. to save more time for the radiologist and then perhaps tell the radiologist now with this system we invested a lot you will uh, double your diagnostic uh, capacity I am gaining time for you you will diagnose more patients this is also possible right and you you have to control the decisions made by the AI and save time, but you have to work longer because you have to check more examinations perhaps. This is also possible, is, is that right? Yes, but I could make you a different question. Do you work with the resident? And do, when you work with the resident, you should teach them. Yes. And then after one year or two years, they will give you the time that you spend for them. So maybe the artificial intelligence will be the same. At the beginning, you should spend a little bit of time to understand if it works correctly. And I think that artificial intelligence software now have the ability to modify the, the customer as the possibility to modify the response or to adapt to the need of hospital. And then after one or three or after one year, the software will give you whatever you want in the same way. So I know it's a, a strange, uh, Comparison between a, a resident and software, but it will be almost so the you, same. You mean uh, the radiologists will be still needed, but not yes. the residents anymore? <laughs> <laughs> we need the residents. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any question, comment from people that are uh, in the room or people that uh, are uh, seeing us in their computers? Question, comments to Professor Polito? 
Okay, so uh, there is uh, one question oh, from Katerina Xinu, I think. Uh, you may, Katerina, you may uh, uh, unmute you yourself and, uh, and put your comment. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Professor Ripolto. It was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, I, I totally agree uh, with all the comments uh, made from uh, Professor Prasopoulos and uh, Hatitakis. Uh, I think that uh, I have only a comment. I think that uh, AI uh, is uh, uh, definitely going to uh, be uh, for a long time, uh, and we must uh, learn how to work uh, with it. Um, but I think that uh, uh, the efficacy of the radiologists uh, will uh, um, rise, and uh, not so much the capacity, because Nowadays, uh, uh, liver exams, uh, uh, as uh, we you talked about, are more complicated. And I think that uh, um, with uh, uh, the use of AI, more radiologists, more radiologists will be uh, um, uh, more uh, will have more efficacy in uh, and will uh, will uh, give uh, um, better reports. Uh, maybe. Uh, now there are five or ten radiologists, and uh, with the, the help of AI, there will be 100, because the uh, AI will help them to be better. And I think uh, this is the the main, uh, um, yes, the the, the best uh, uh, thing that AI will provide us uh, in the next few years. Uh, um, and as far as the capacity, uh, I think that uh, it will be uh, less. Um, uh, efficient, uh, the capacity of examination that that we will uh, be able to uh, report. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Is any other question, comment? No. Since the time is running, and since we decided to get advantage of you with two talks instead of one, please proceed to the next uh, topic, which is uh, spectral imaging on abdominal CT added value for lesions assessment and so the work any added possible added value is missing oh, because sorry. because the spectral imaging has has proved his uh, his ability so yeah. there is no 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 reason to to to, 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 to my value uh, okay. <laughs> so thank you please okay thank you again and they hope you will enjoy also with this presentation dedicated to another great topic in the radiological world, that is the application of spectral imaging on abdominal CT. Well, we know that computer tomography today is, wise, is widely used in clinical practice on diagnostic imaging world because it's quite available, it's low expensive, and it offers a really fast image acquisition with very high spatial resolution. Therefore, we can apply this technique in the oncologic world just to recognize, uh, sorry, sorry, just to recognize the lesion and to stage them. We can uh, you and follow up along the time in order to assess the response. In the last ten years, the importance of uh, CT is increasing a lot with the coronary CT because we can recognize the small coronary arteries and we can uh, provide uh, any prognostic information regarding the development of uh, myocardial ischemia. And obviously, the CT is the best technique in the emergency department because it allows us to solve the most of problems in uh, everyday life. And the computer tomography, in its sim simplest definition, is an X-ray system that rotates around the body of patient. And we have a detection system in the opposite way that measures the amount of radiation that coming out from patient in order to create an anatomical tomographic section of each part of the human body. And usually on CT imaging, the differentiation of tissue is based on the ounce field unit inside the voxel that are quite more or less specific for each different tissue due to the different attenuation value of the tissue. And it's related to the contrast enhancement because the contrast agent allow us to define the behavior according to the pathophysiological modification of each different lesion. But the material termination is related to the material characteristics, also called the electron density, that could be really specific for each different tissue. 
and it's related to the tube voltage, so to the energetic level. And therefore, it may vary according to the different energetic level. The vendors, since 19 till 2015, started the so-called slice war, but today we should say slice competition is better, in order to create a really wide panel detector and that it allow us to acquire the very wide range of volume of our body in a really faster manner, so in a really few seconds. But unfortunately, today, the anatomical imaging is now really good. And then we have a very little benefits in uh, gaining speed or resolution. And for this reason, now the different manufacturers, different vendors create a new world. They are moving toward a new competition that is related to the functional imaging through the introduction of spectral CT imaging and photo counting imaging. Why we are in front of this new competition? Because today we want to know what is the tissue. We would like to know what is the behavior of tissue, especially after the treatment. Today we cannot rely on the size, on the shape or on the location, but we need to know each different component of our material or better of our body. We should able to, the, uh, to distinguish the calcium, the iron, the water, the iodine or the gadolinium and so on because each specific component can represent a label of each different disease. So it can be really specific to make the correct diagnosis and to assess the response as well. And now I'll try to describe you how the spectral imaging works. In the creation of images on X-ray system, there exists two different phenomena that we call the photoelectric phenomenon and Compton scatter phenomenon. Therefore, if we want to uh, evaluate the modification of these two components, we need two different measurements to fully characterize them. Because if we have only two measurements, we are able to derive the, the curve of attenuation of scatter Compton and uh, photoelectric effect. The phenomena have different behavior at a different energetic level. So in one case, we can assist at the increase of one effect and increase of the other one. And obviously, different components of our body has a different Compton and scatter effect at different energetic level. And so finally, we need obviously only two measurements at different energy that must be acquired simultaneously with the same spatial and temporal resolution. Maybe it's quite complicated to define, I agree with you, and I'll try to describe in a simple way. We have our CT scanner. We use just one, only one tube detector, but we have a, uh, only one tube, sorry. And we have a specific detector that is able to register different energetic levels. So from our X-ray, we are able to derive the high energetic level and the low energetic level. And therefore we can derive obviously the uh, scatter effect and photon count and uh, Compton effect, and we can derive our curve. But the most important thing that we can derive several specific images that are strictly related to the scatter and Compton effect. So we can create the non-contrast images, we can quantify the iodine, we can appreciate the Z electron density of each tissues, just having only two measurements. And the spectral CT usually acquires a CT data set that derived from different energetic levels, high and low. And unlike the conventional CT, in which one image is acquired per rotation at single energetic level, the spectral CT acquires simultaneously images that derive from different energetic level, obviously depending on the, the different manufacturers. Usually the Siemens uh, use the two source approach with 80 and 100 K, they are 140 KV energetic level. The G use the so-called single rapid KV switching, higher and lower at the same time while well, Philips used the dual layer detector. So it used the detector to derive the energetic level. But in most simple definition, usually we have a two great family of CT scanner. Those one that use the tube to create a two different energetic level. And so we call it source-based dual energy. And we have the scanner with detector-based energetic level. So the deconvolution of the analysis uh, happens at the level of the panel detector. 
The idea behind the spectroscopy is that the different materials or the attenuation of different materials behaves differently if we look at different energetic levels. And obviously, this can improve the information because, because it helps the clinician in discriminating between some materials and the other one that can image differently at low and, energe and high energetic level. The typical example is the calcium and the iodine. At very low energetic level, they are quite similar in attenuation values. While increasing in energetic level, we can better appreciate them. This is a typical example of patient with some kidney stones during the contrast agent. If we look at low energetic level, we are not able to distinguish the component. Increasing the energetic level, we can delete the calcium and recognizing only the iodine inside our body. And therefore, the use of spectral CT today has two main advantages over conventional single energetic level. The first advantage is the possibility to create the so-called material decomposition or material-based images. It means that we could highlight in our set of images only the pixel that we want. We can highlight only the calcium, only the iodine, only the water, or we can delete each different pixel. So it means that from our contrastographic phase, we can derive an iodine-free images. We can delete the iodine and create an enhanced CT scan. And therefore, we can save one contrastographic phase, and we can save, obviously, the radiation dose. But we can also create a colorimetric map strictly related to the zeta effective value of each tissue. So really specific for each component. The other great advantages is the possibility to create the monochromatic images at different energetic levels. So we can derive a very low energetic level, increasing the iodine attenuation, or we can increase the energetic visualization reducing the artifacts. And what it means from a Hegel point of view? We can work with our standard protocol with 120 KB setting or with 100 KB setting. And later, we can derive several energetic levels in order to increase the contrast between the lesion and surrounding parenchyma, in this case with pancreas. But from our single portal minus phase, we can derive also the angiographic phase, obtain a geographic study, or we can also highlight the presence of stent reducing the metal artifacts. And let me show a typical example from our uh, everyday clinical practice. This was a patient with several hypervascular liver metastases, and with our CT scan, we should uh, find out which could be the possible cause. And we are looking also at two specific images. If we look at 100 KB, we are not sure that we are in front of small tumor of the jejunum. But if we try to reduce the energetic level with low mono E with the 40 KB, we can enhance the brightness of each different lesion. And so now our eyes becomes more confident in a recognized lesion and making the correct diagnosis. And obviously we are able also to combine the images with the electron density, creating a new map that is quite similar to the PET CT scanner. Another typical example of a patient with suspected pancreatic cancer. In this case, during the arterial phase, due to the poor enhancement, we are not able to recognize any sure pancreatic lesion, what we can do? Again, we can try to work with low mono energetic level. And so we can increase the differences in terms of attenuation values between the iodine, pancreas, and hypoattenuating neoplastic lesion. So again, we become more confident. What it means? It means that the spectral CT approach allows us to obtain the conventional anatomical information, typical of standard single energetic level, and at the same time, we can obtain a colorimetric map specific for each component. We can delete the iodine and obtain virtual non contrast. We can highlight only the Z effective of each specific tissue, or we can quantify the iodine and so on with different applications. So the old CT scanner would offer us, usually offer very high spatial resolution, very high temporal resolution, and brighten brightness only, so based on grayscale. While the new spectral CT scanner offers us really high spatial resolution with high temporal resolution, and they offer also the so-called energetic or colorimetric resolution. And therefore, we can try to use or to apply in clinical practice the spectral CT with different aim, 
we could be able to better visualize and characterize the lesion. We will be able to follow up better the neoplastic lesion, and obviously we can assess the tumor response to therapy. And I'll start with uh, some example from clinical practice. This was a patient with uh, abdominal gastrointestinal tumor. It was uh, suspected. In this case, we have uh, an arterial phase in which the tumor is not enhancing. And so we know that it's quite difficult to, to distinguish the tumor from the food. But what we can do now with the new scanner? We are able to create the material decomposition. We can derive the unenhanced CT scan. And so no hyperactivity lesion can be recognizable inside the duodenum lumen. Using the iodine map, we can appreciate the hyperaccumulation of iodine. And with the low energetic level, we can enhance the differences between each different tissues. So starting from our standard imaging, now we can increase our sensitivity and highlight only the disease. Another great advantage is the possibility to evaluate the gallbladder stone disease because it's a common disorder. And we know that in most of the cases, the gallbladder stones are not recognizable on CT because they are isodense if compared to the bile content because they have the similar attenuation. And so let me show this example. Patient with cholecystitis, the diagnosis is quite simple because we can recognize the typical thickening of the gallbladder wall. We can appreciate the layered enhancement, but no stones can be recognizable inside because we have no calcification of the stones. What we can do now, again, we can derive our spectral information and now immediately using the Z electron density, we can appreciate the different attenuation of the stones compared to the bile. And we can uh, appreciate that it looks like the fat due to the high component of fat inside the stone. And obviously also the other different map may allow us to better distinguish and recognize this lesion that is the cause of the disease. Well, one of the most important applications is the definition of incidentaloma lesion, because usually the incidentaloma is an unanticipated CT findings that are discovered during an examination that is not related to the indication of CT examination. So uh, we find it in a lucky or unlucky way. And they can be frequently found on chest CT, like the micronodules or the thyroid nodules, but they may be fine. We, can, we could found them also in the abdominal domain. And in most of the cases, the incidental loma are not clinical significant, but in other cases can be a tumor. And before to better describe the incidental loma, I would, to talk, I would like to spend a few minutes talking about the pseudo announcement. When we work with the CT, we know that the effective enhancement of lesion depends, depends on surrounding tissue. In this case, we perform a CT scan of vial with water. We know that the answer for the unit of water is almost zero. And the part of water that is surrounded by contrast agent present a really high attenuation values, while the same water surrounded by the air a, present a negative value. But if we try to reanalyze the same images with spectral approach, no iodine is present inside. So we are more confident in the define it as a simple water. In the same way, when we are in front of an incidental loma, like in this patient, we have a hypodensity uh, lesion on the left kidney, we can be more confident in making the correct uh, approach. In this case, the lesion has a 60, 60 ounce field unit as attenuation values, so it could be a tumor, but it could be also an uh, hemorrhagic cyst. If we work only with the portal venous space, we are not able to characterize them. But now we can create the material decomposition. We can derive the virtual non-enhanced CT scan, and we can appreciate the hyperattenuating alteration in line with blood content, no iodine uptake. And so now we are really sure about the benign diagnosis of complicated hemorrhagic cysts. Another example is a patient with rectal cancer. We know that in everyday clinical practice, we should make the staging of rectal cancer with MRI and not with CT, because MRI has a bad soft tissue contrast. 
But in this case, we have a CT scanner. We can evaluate that alteration, can be clearly recognizable. Using the material decomposition, we can increase the confidence in making diagnosis. But in this case, the problem is not to make the diagnosis because it's quite simple. But what we can do with CT? Usually, we can reconstruct the images on sagittal, coronal, paraxial plane. And so in one case, we spend only four minutes to make an overall evaluation of our body. While with MR, we need more than 20 minutes for a correct protocol. And therefore, also with CT now, we are able to correctly stage the lesion and recognize the different structures or the enhancing tumor. And let's move to another really important application in everyday clinical practice, the characterization of kidney stones. Usually, the kidney stones may be made of uh, uric acid or um, made of oscillate of calcium. In case, uh, when we work with spectral CD, now we are able to create the used ERIC map that are able to analyze and highlight only the uric acid, typically of the growth or of the stones. And so, in this case, we can recognize the lesion that is an hyperattenuating on an enhanced scan. We can think that it's calcium, but it's acid uric. In the opposite way, we have another stones on the distal tract of the left ureter. In this case, we have only few components of, using, of a uric acid and an important component, an important core of calcium. What means from a clinical point of view? In this case, we can treat the lesion only, by, uh, only through the alkalinization of urine and with ultrasound lithotripsy. In the other case, we need a surgical approach. If we do not have any spectral information, we can make the uncorrect treatment, and so we could theoretically create some hematoma or hemorrhagic alteration of the kidney and the ureter. So it offers us to correctly address the patient for the best management. Another possible application is also those patients that are treated with the radiofrequency ablation for hepatocellular carcinoma. In this case, the arterial phase is not so enhancing, not so important. And so we do not do know what to do with this hyper component on the left side of treated lesion. But if we try to use the virtual non contrast and especially the iodine concentration, the iodine map, we can appreciate the accumulation of iodine along the left side of the residual disease. And so we become more confident, but moving forward in the uh, lower part of the lesion, we can move from poor quality images to really hyper attenuating alteration. And so we are more confident with the diagnosis of HCC relapse, another possible application. And now I would like to show a really challenging case. We have a patient with a left ureter tumor that was treated with a double J catheter. Due to the catheter, it's not possible to recognize any more any tumor in the distal tract of the ureter, neither in portal venous phase or in the urographic phase. What we can do now, again, we can work with very low monoenergetic level. We can increase the differentiation between different tissue, and we can appreciate this focal neoplastic alteration. And again, if we use the z-electron density, we are able to recognize the different components of each tissue, and we can fuse both of them and become more confident in our diagnosis. There's a patient with a left kidney tumor treated with radiofrequency ablation. In the first follow-up, we would like to know if in this area, in this cystic alteration, we have residual disease or not. We would like to differentiate the fluid from hyperattenuating alteration that could be hemorrhage. What we have to do, again, having only the mortal venous phase, we can create the virtual non-enhanced CT scan. And so the upper fluid is blood, while the lower part of fluid is not blood. And if we look at the iodine images, oh, sorry, uh, we can recognize the higher accumulation of iodine inside. And so again, we increase our sensitivity. This is an example of patient that was addressed to the emergency department for abdominal pain. Looking on CT images, we can appreciate immediately the differences in terms of attenuation value between the right side duodenum, uh, right side bowel loop, and the left side bowel loop. 
And obviously, working with a very low energetic level, we can increase the differences in terms of attenuation, and we could quantify also the attenuation of iodine, both in axial and in the coronal images. And if we are in Russia, we can use our colorimetric map, Z-electron density, in making immediately the diagnosis with patients with an internal hernia and hypoperfused bowel loop. Another really tricky case, this is that one patient suspected for uh, relapse of urinary bladder disease, urinary bladder neoplastic disease. In this case, we can appreciate hyperattenuating area in the lower part of the urinary bladder and hyperattenuating area along the urinary bladder wall. Using the portal venous phase and using the coronal images, we can appreciate both at once we can recognize that the absolute value is almost the same, almost 60 ounce per unit. And now I may ask you, which could be the tumor, the upper one or the lower one? Lower. Okay, all of the, my colleagues said the lower, so I agree with clear. Adam. <laughs> what we have to do now, we have to make the material decomposition, virtual unenhanced CD scan, hyper attenuation of lower lesion, so this is blood, and this is the I, uh, this is the neoplastic component, and it is more evident when the, when we use the zeta electric uh, map. So, fusing the images again, we can hide what is benign and I like what is malignant. So, it's a good approach. And let's move to another example of a patient with rectal cancer. Typical uh, follow up with only portal venous phase after three months of the treatment. In this set of imaging, we are not to recognize any nodular lesion, no fluid on the pleural space, no lymph nodes on the mediastinum, no cardiac alteration or pericardial fluid, no spleen or efocal liver lesion, no pancreatic alteration, homogeneous enhancement of both kidney, we have adenomyomatosis of the bladder, a cortical defect in the right kidney, no free fluid, no any mass, only focal uh, atheromatic alteration on the aorta. But I think that everybody considered the, this examination as negative, like me. What we can do now, especially if we, have, if we are in Russia, we have an, an high amount of uh, CT scanner to write the report. We can look only the colorimetric images and immediately we can recognize some stone inside the gallbladder, but it's not clinical importance. But let's look at the lung. In this case, we do not have any nodular lesion, but we have a high amount of hypoperfusion area. No iodine uptake is evident in that area. What we can do now, we can look back at our set of images. We can work with a very low energetic level, and so we can increase the density of iodine. And now, a very amount of a thromboembolic uh, alteration inside the pulmonary arteries are evident. So again, we increase our sensitivity and we make the correct diagnosis, even if we use a portal beam space. And so to better describe the application of a spectral CT in everyday clinical practice, theoretically, I make you another question. We are in front of the University of Luden, but I think that nobody is able to distinguish the season, which is the correct one. We can recognize uh, the building, with window, with, uh, with, uh, with the green and herbs and so on, but nobody can offer or make us the correct season decision. Now we can add our spectral approach, our colorimetric approach, and I think that everybody becomes again more uh, confident with the season. So recognizing uh, the spring, the summer, and the autumn at once. Well, to conclude this uh, presentation, we can say that today the detector based spectral CT is an exciting and evolving technology that provides a new layer of information that previously were unavailable using a single energetic level. And one of the most important advantages can be the detection and characterization of lesion, possibility to derive several different map of, of visualization, and so providing a, a really great amount of information increasing so the confidence in making diagnosis. And it is possible to improve also the oncologic staging and management of 
oncologic patient because we could decrease the number of contrastographic phase and so we can, could save the dose during the long time follow-up. But we can reduce also the amount of contrast media because the software now is able to quantify if iodine is present or not, independently from the final quality, from the, from the final amount of contrast agent that we used. And these are uh, summarizing graph of uh, different possible applications in other fields, like in the goods, in the abdominal domain, and neuro domain, cardiovascular domain. So it's really useful to have a lot of map to make the correct diagnosis. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Pink Floyd, because just 30 years ago, they understand the importance of uh, X-ray of light <laughs> Uh, because they was able to characterize and derive the colorimetric imaging map. Like we do in everyday clinical practice with more energetic level, with, with common contrast, with that effective iodine density, and so on. And again, thank you very much for the kind attention. Thank you for this spectacular talk. <laughs> I, can, I have to read myself, it was uh, an excellent talk, very comprehensive. And again, you managed in less than 20 minutes to, to gather, to, to give a very good insight, <laughs> insight to, 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 to a very interesting talk. Oh, yes. Although this technology is not a new one. Uh, I remember that back to the 90s, uh, during my fellowship in, in one uh, of the major hospitals in Boston, they decided to put a lot of money to a Spectre City. Okay. Six months later, they decided that this is a wasting of money <laughs> because they, they were not able to find uh, significant applications for this uh, nice, spectral, very expensive city. But nowadays, this is the bold answer of CT to the, to the last developments of MRI, tissue characterization. Yeah. So do you think that this is the future of CT? Because we now we are buying the new city. Uh, as you told, this is a, an old type of city. But uh, imagine uh, someone who will uh, buy a 320 row city that you call it an old one. Okay. <laughs> is, is, this a, really, is this the future of city? To be honest, this is not the future because this is the state of the art. Today we should have, if it is possible, a spectral city, but the future is the photon counting, unfortunately. Uh, in Europe or all over the world, now we have a 35 uh, photon counting CT scanner that uh, uh, they are really expensive, but now they make the count of each specific electron density. So they are able to characterize all of the lesion with very thin slices, 0 0.1 millimeters, so with very high spatial resolution without any noise because they do not register the energetic level under the 25 kiloelectron volts. So uh, this will be the future, the next future for the next year. And the spectral imaging is more, is quite, uh, offer almost the same information with a little bit uh, bigger pixel. But I think that spectral and photon counting are what we have to do now. And then the next ten year we will have a new technology. And so sure, the CT is increasing more is increasing really more quickly than MR the development. And if I have to invest some money, I will invest on the CT. Really? Is it possible? And obviously, the photon count is really expensive, but the spectral is a good compromise between the standard imaging and the next future. But unfortunately, if you want to know the photon counting that is the future. Uh, is not enough in the future because we do not have any, we do not have enough contrast media that can work with electron density. So if we buy a photon counting, we have to work like with the spectral or with the or, or the CD scanner. But this will be the future. I think that also the industry will spend time and money in the new contrast agent. Really? We can do more and more and more in the next year. So we have to study, learn and the stay update. So, uh, uh, thank you for your answer. It's clear that CT nowadays is running uh, uh, with higher speed than MRI. But that's why I will, uh, I will put an, an, uh, the question another way. Yeah. Is CT the future of MRI or MRI is the future of CT? Because 
Maya it has also done a lot in, in functional imaging and in tissue characterization. And at the end of some century, I think that just one modality will prevail. Implicity or Maya. <laughs> I think that uh, five years ago when we met uh, Adam, I said to him, uh, because someone made the same question, the, uh, the same question, and I said uh, that the MRI, that the CT is the wife. So you can trust on her at all of the time, <laughs> and she will never abandon, abandon you, <laughs> while the MRI is like uh, another kind or women, and so you cannot trust so much. And uh, for the same reason, I think that with a city, uh, the city will be the future. Yeah, sure. For the last 15 years, no, um, the industry do not invest so much on the MRI, while invest a lot of money on city. And so I think that we have to think in the same way. Maybe the city will be the future. And also the artificial intelligence will be more, uh, will work better if combined with the CT more than MRI. Because the protocol are more simple, they offer really exact attenuation value, it's really specific, so the information will be more reliable, absolutely. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Perhaps if we, if we try to be more diplomatic, perhaps uh, the more reliable, reliable wife is MRI for neuro and for musculoskeletal. It depends. Thoracic and abdominal is perhaps uh, for CT. Yes. You, you cannot have so many wives. <laughs> so I, I, I thank you for your answer. It's, it's very uh, reasonable, but I'm just on the opposite side. So I, I believe that uh, MRI will do great. We'll see. After 200 years, we'll make each other. Uh, we'll, yes, we'll exactly. Find, we'll, yes. <laughs> That's the right question. So, is there any question from the audience in the room, from those colleagues that are uh, in, in their computers or anybody else? Adam? Up to now, I think not. And what uh, Thank you very much. Very nice. Very interesting. Very My question is allowing for the dual detector application. What about the extra beam? I mean, 40, uh, for example, 40 kilovolt or 6 kilovolt. Doesn't it add extra radiation burden to the patient? Possibly uh, uh, making the omission of the non enhanced phase a shame. I don't know. Okay, the CT scanner that use the, the detector based approach do not need any okay. further radiation dose because uh, only the panel make the analysis. And so you can work today with 120 kb setting, but now the new CT scanner are able to, to work with 100 kb. It was not possible five years ago. So if you have a rapid kb switching or, or double source, you have to increase the radiation dose that you give to the patient to obtain the spectral information. While in the other case, if you work with spectral detector, you can work with a normal radiation dose or saving if you use only one oscillatic phase. So it's a uh, little bit different. Very yeah. much. This extra radiation dose, is it less than the dose of an enhanced scan? I mean, do we have any benefit? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's not so simple because uh, when you work with a source-based approach and you have double energy that to work on the patient, you have to decide before the acquisition if you want to work with a spectral approach. Because in, uh, in contrary, you work with one tube or with one object level. So the answer is not so simple because you have to decide before if you use double energy and we're using one contrast of that phase to obtain spectral information. While if you have the single detector, if you have the detector approach, you have, you have nothing to choice. You work with your standard approach and you can look at whatever you want and you can save the dose that you want. So according to the vendors and to the manufacturer, you have to adapt your mind to the need of the hospital, to the need of the CT scan. Uh, any other question or comment? So, once again, thank you. We are grateful. Thank you. We enjoyed your, both of your talks. Thank you, thank you. for what you have told to us. Uh, so and then uh, hopefully we'll see you again in the future. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you want, <laughs> we'd like. it's an honor for me <laughs> to be here. It's an honor for us as well, but this is it's a pleasure at the same time. 
which is <laughs> which makes things better. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much.